Hello friends, this is Dr. Rajal Shah. Today in my high yield series, I would like to bring a, another important topic. So I will start with a case. A 67 year old male presented with uh, bone pain. He had a history of prostate cancer, grade group 5. That was Gleason score 4 plus 5 equal 9. And he had a history of treatment with anti-androgen therapy. His PSA was 1.5 nanogram per ml, so he underwent uh, a bone biopsy and that on here. And as you can see here, there are like these dark blue cells with some crushing artifacts that you can see between the bone spicules. There is also a desmoplastic reaction. At higher magnification, you see a pretty prominent nested organoid morphology uh, cells are pretty crowded and blue with high nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio and when we look at higher magnification these cells have a salt and pepper chromatin pattern you don't see any prominent nucleoli there is also nuclear molding and there is a pretty brisk mitotic activity that you can see uh, in this particular image uh, uh, the immunophenotype showed PSA was negative and KX3.1 was focally positive. Synaptophysin, chromogranin and CD56, all three were diffusely positive. KI67, KI67 proliferation marker demonstrated high proliferation activity, more than 80%. So despite PSA negativity, my diagnosis for this case is metastatic small cell high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma of the prostate origin. This brings up a very important high yield topic today, neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Uh, there has been a significant confusion as well as misconception regarding this particular uh, topic. So I will try my best to try to clarify some of these issues. So there are two important issues to understand when we talk about neuroendocrine prostate cancer. There is one which is clinically significant neuroendocrine differentiation and then the second is neuroendocrine expression demonstrated by neuroendocrine markers. So first when we talk about clinically significant neuroendocrine prostate cancer we are really talking about a terminal stage prostate cancer or, or almost like an end of kind of biologically uh, significant prostate cancer. Uh, prostate cancers as you know are typically hormone sensitive or hormone naive. At some point when the anti-androgen treatment is instituted, some of these prostate cancer eventually become castration resistance or androgen independent and neuroendocrine prostate cancer is considered to be the last phases of the prostate cancer progression cycle. So that is why when we talk about neuroendocrine differentiation in prostate cancer, we are really talking about a clinically aggressive uh, prostate cancer that typically is treated with multimodality uh, treatment, specifically chemotherapy, uh, and uh, the prognosis is very uh, poor for these patients. Comparison, the second issue is the neuroendocrine expression demonstrated by neuroendocrine markers. And as you can see here, this 2016 WHO classification lists six different entities under the neuroendocrine prostate cancer category. Uh, and uh, three of them are relatively well differentiated tumors. So there can be a usual prostate adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation. Then there is adenocarcinoma with penis cell neuroendocrine differentiation and well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor or carcinoid tumor. These three entities, even though they show neuroendocrine expression by neuroendocrine markers, clinically, they are often insignificant or biologically, they are not aggressive tumors. So the very important point to keep in mind that Particularly clinically significant neuroendocrine prostate cancer is small cell carcinoma, large cell carcinoma, and the most common is the mixed 
small or large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and a senior ductal adenocarcinoma. So very important misconception that or, or rather I should say is that an important point that you should keep in mind that neuroendocrine markers expression does not equate to clinically significant neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So let's talk about this neuroendocrine prostate cancer differentiation. Now only rare uh, primary small cell carcinoma arise de novo through the malignant transformation of neuroendocrine or neural crest cells. Vast majority of neuroendocrine prostate cancers are believed to arise from treatment naive hormone sensitive prostate adenocarcinoma when these uh, prostate cancer patients receive androgen deprivation therapy specifically with a new generation of androgen receptor signaling inhibitors such as enzylatumide and abiraterol. Some of these patients become androgen independent or develop resistance to treatment and then spectrum of diseases upon uh, diseases emerge upon the therapeutic resistance which can be AR independent which is typically a neuroendocrine phenotype it can also be AR dependent AR independent can be small cell or treatment emergent mixed neuroendocrine prostate cancer which is the most common form of neuroendocrine prostate cancer as I mentioned to you earlier AR dependent uh, but, uh, resistant prostate cancer has a castration resistant prostate cancer with standard phenotypic features. So uh, small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma clearly is the most important uh, clinically significant neuroendocrine prostate cancer. It is high grade neuroendocrine tumor with relatively typical oat cell lung cell carcinoma the small cell carcinoma morphologic features characterized by high NC ratio, salt and pepper chromatin pattern, nuclear molding, and brisk mitotic activity. The morphologic variation include intermediate cell phenotype with slightly open chromatin and visible small nucleoli which can be seen in 30 to 40 percent of cases. And majority of these cases have a history of usual prostate carcinoma. So when you see small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, either in primary or in metastatic setting, always it is a good idea to uh, make sure that whether if you can uh, trace the history of prostate cancer for these patients. The interval between diagnosis of usual prostate carcinoma and small neuroendocrine carcinoma is uh, about median 25 months with a range of 1 to 300 months. So here is an example of intermediate small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. The cells are relatively large with slightly more recognizable uh, uh, cytoplasm. At higher magnification even uh, you still you see the nuclear chromatin is pretty even and powdery but you may see some small nucleoli within this type of cells and also note very high grade nature of the cells, brisk mitotic activity, high NC ratio. So overall you still have good features of neuroendocrine differentiation and it is very important to do neuroendocrine markers in this particular type of situation. So let us understand the immunophenotype of small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. One or more neuroendocrine markers are positive in almost 90% of cases. But if you have a classic small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma but not showing neuroendocrine markers expression, technically you can still make the diagnosis. In that situation, I think it is a good idea to also have other markers uh, done. Prostate markers are typically negative or weakly positive in 17 to 25 percent of cases. So very important point to keep in mind if you have a tumor which is diffusely expressing prostate markers, it is unlikely to be a high grade small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. P63 and high molecular weight cytokeratin can be positive in 24 to 35 percent of cases. KI67 proliferation marker is very high, typically more than 80%. K67 
TTF1 can be positive in up to 50% of cases. So TTF1 expression will not differentiate uh, primary prostate from metastatic lung origin, small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And ERG gene fusion by fish is very suggestive of primary prostate small cell carcinoma, positive in about 50% of cases. But an important point to keep in mind, important point to keep in mind that uh, this gene fusion does not reliably generate ERG protein overexpression by immunohistochemistry. So immunohistochemistry is often unreliable. These are highly aggressive tumor with median two to five year survival of 27.5 percent and 14.3 percent respectively. Uh, more than half of these patients typically present with metastatic disease. But an important point is that because of high proliferation, these tumors are typically treated aggressively with platinum-based multimodality chemotherapy regimen, uh, which may or may not be combined with androgen deprivation therapy depending on the other component of the tumor. And then another important point to keep in mind is that high-grade small cell endocrine, endocrine carcinoma should not be provided glycine grade. So here is a, another very interesting case where you can see uh, conventional acinar adenocarcinoma which appears relatively well differentiated. And then you have next to it very poorly differentiated tumor showing high NC ratio, nuclear kind of uh, hyperchromasia, salt and paper like chromatin pattern, nuclear molding. There is also some crushing changes. Here is a one more example of, of the image. And I think you would agree that I think this particular uh, morphological features are quite suggestive of uh, neuroendocrine differentiation, high grade neuroendocrine differentiation. And note here this uh, pretty prominent uh, nuclear crushing and uh, uh, so the diagnosis for this case is mixed uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma and acinar prostate adenocarcinoma this is a biphasic carcinoma with distinct recognizable admixed components of high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma and usual acinar and ductal carcinoma this is the most common clinical presentation of neuroendocrine carcinoma in prostate cancer. Transition is often abrupt and recognizable. Any amount of small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma is clinically significant. Patients have an aggressive outcome. So you can grade the conventional SNR component, but the small cell high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma component, as I said, should not be provided glycine grade. And this type of patients are typically treated with combination of androgen deprivation and platinum-based chemotherapy agents. The, this particular uh, differentiation which I showed you and in several examples is not always straightforward. You are going to encounter some difficult cases in prostate biopsies. So here is one example from my practice. In this particular case, you can see that this is pretty proliferative looking tumor you do see some conventional acinar type of differentiation with a lot more cytoplasm in these uh, cells. But these particular cells show somewhat crushing and uh, they are kind of little bit worrying for uh, uh, you know, high grade neuroendocrine differentiation. But an important point to keep in mind that at high power you can see that these cells have still relatively abundant cytoplasm. The chromatin is somewhat smooth. So again, these are the type of situation where I think you want to do neuroendocrine markers, you want to use PSA mark and other prostate markers, as well as ki 67 proliferation marker. When I did these markers, PSA was diffusely positive in this particular patient. ki 67 was moderate. It was about 50 to 60 percent and neuroendocrine markers were expressed focally. So based on this combined morphology and immunophenotype, my diagnosis for this case is prostate adenocarcinoma Gleason score 5 plus 5 equal 10. So an important point that I would like to re-emphasize is that I think think about what is the typical immunophenotype of high-grade neuroendocrine tumor. 
high grade neuroendocrine tumor typically express one of uh, these three neuroendocrine markers there is also a new uh, marker called insm1 which can also be applied they are going to be positive in more than 90 percent of cases and typically more diffusely positive an important point to keep in mind that PSA is typically negative or only focally positive. So a case like one which I showed to you, a diffuse PSA expression is very unusual of a high-grade neuroendocrine marker. AR is uh, high-grade neuroendocrine cancer. Androgen receptor is typically negative for uh, high-grade neuroendocrine differentiation, but it is not reliable due to deregulated androgen signaling in these patients. Another important marker we talked about is ki 67 which is typically diffusely high, more than 80%. And then another uh, which majority of the lab do not have is that the retinoblastoma protein would be typically lost uh, during the transdifferentiation step uh, in neuroendocrine markers negative tumor. So here is a summary. Keep in mind that you are going to have increased neuroendocrine markers of expression decreased PSA expression, decreased AR signaling, increased proliferation, and decreased retinoblastoma gene expression in a typical high-grade neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So if you have immunophenotype that does not support this, and morphologically you have somewhat borderline type of features, then I think you should resist, I think, calling that high-grade small cell neuroendocrine differentiation. So these are my final take home points for clinically localized prostate cancer unless there are clear morphologic neuroendocrine features. Immunostaining for neuroendocrine expression is not recommended because as we discussed neuroendocrine markers expression does not equate to clinically significant neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So that's a very important message to keep in mind. Given its dismal clinical implications, the term neuroendocrine differentiation is best reserved for high-grade cancers and not usual type adenocarcinomas or well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Advanced metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer may manifest a range of molecular features of neuroendocrine differentiation and combination of molecular evaluation and morphologic features may be required. This particular metastatic setting is still an evolving area uh, with a lot of research going on. So I think definitely that particular area is still evolving. So with that note, I thank you for your attention. Uh, if you like this video, please share with your colleagues, uh, like it, give me comments, and I appreciate your time and uh, listening. Thank you.